Welcome students. Uh, my name is Daniel Röhr. I'm a landscape architect and thank you very much Nadia as always to introduce me. Um, uh, just a couple of words. I was a landscape architect for 15 years in Berlin and had also an office in Shanghai and I've been appointed as a professor here in 2006 and I've been here since teaching and researching. And over my most uh, research area is all in LID, which is stormwater management, really. But in the last few years, last six, seven years, I realized in education that um, the multisensorial has not been addressed. And I wrote a textbook for introductory studios to be used um, globally, hopefully, um, to investigate around the senses in landscape architecture more deeply. And I will give you an introduction to the book, what it is about and why I did it. But I think it's really important when you do something like that, you have to acknowledge the people who worked with you. And my research colleague, Michelle gagnon Creeley, she also contributed to the book and the research and did the layout of the book. I did a lot of the drawings as well, so did the students, but I would like to also acknowledge Michelle, who is a graduate from our MLA program and also has a planning degree and helped over many years to make this book happen. There also goes a big thank you to the two classes, which were kind of the guinea pig classes to run the uh, um, assignments in the course, which I was leading first before I wrote the book. Uh, and a lot of the assignments and examples are in the book, and it is important to acknowledge those people as well. Neda Rohania is important. She did some illustrations. She draws similar to me and helped with some of the illustrations in the Sense Walk chapter. Dr. Fei Wei also helped with the research from China for the Chinese gardens, uh, which are talked about in the Sense Walk mapping. And then I had peer reviewers, former students and professionals to review the book, uh, and my partner, Jane, to also help with the editing. I think it's important that these people are acknowledged. And the book is dedicated uh, to Cornelia Hahn Oberlander, which you I'm sure all know, it's a very important landscape architect who died, uh, <clears throat> it's now in two, uh, two, nearly two years ago, in May, we two years, with 99 and 11 months. So she was nearly 100. She's one of the most prolific landscape architects globally. She's a Canadian and lived very close to campus here. And we often met. <clears throat> She's originally from Germany, but had to flee Germany due to Nazi Germany and then came here and established her career. One of the most uh, inspiring people I've met in my life. And uh, before she passed away, I was dedicated the book already for her. So I want to also acknowledge her. So this is also a very private photo. It's one of the last photos I was able to take before she passed away. But about the book, as we all know, landscape is rooted in the landscape. And because of we are now so connected to the computer and we sit mostly in offices, we have through the Renaissance period forgotten that actually landscape is in the environment and you have to engage with it in it. And so I wrote a book where I argue you need to first understand the surrounding of a site and go there multiple times to really experience it deeply before you make ideas. If you do not understand the site and the surrounding context, you can't program what the site really needs. There may be an assignment what the professors want, which is very important, but you need to go to site to make sure that that is really also what the site needs. And that starts uh, including the birds and uh, the critters and the people who are using it uh, and engage yourself with the site with the five senses. When I was a small child, I grew up a lot in the summer at the log cabin of my granny in the Austrian mountains near Innsbruck in the 60s. And you can see outhouse, gas lighting, no electricity right up in the mountains. And that had a profound experience uh, a life experience and profound experience for my whole career on me, maybe also why I turned into a landscape architect. Here you can see how this um, is positioned very close to a glacier, which is obviously melting right now. 
um, but in the 60s it wasn't. And this is very close to that. It's near Innsbruck, high up in the Stubai uh, glaciers, uh, this uh, cabin. And it was around it were the cows, behind was the barn. And we, as a child, I had to um, help with the cows and bring them in with their bells and uh, learn how to milk and so on. So very interesting experience. But I also experienced the landscape and what it can do, water, rain, the power of lightning, uh, and so on. So it was a very interesting experience. And it made me um, understand and respect the landscape early. You can see here the hand of my mother on the side with the rope. I was about four years old in the later hose and trying to go hiking with my parents. And, um, but I was always very curious to investigate the landscape and at an early age started to experience it, but also respect it. I have a very strong um, feeling about the mountains. They, they, they can be dangerous and they can be angry if we don't treat them wisely and well. And that's why I recently just developed a landslide tool, which is on our, our UBC blog. I'm happy to send you the link later. But why I was uh, interested in this? When I was a child, I was making little dikes and dams with the water coming down in the mountains. And water is multisensorial. It smells fresh. It has tucks, tuck, with touch, it's tuck, tactile. It tastes good if it's clean. And um, it, it, it's cooling, so also tactile. And you uh, can hear it, it makes a sound. And you can see it, so it's also beautiful. So it's a multisensorial experience. And that led me to understand the complexity of the matter of the environment and that we need to understand it much more deeply. Most children, when they are little, and I was little or young at that time, when they go to art class in high school, they draw uh, realistic. But my mother uh, was an art dealer in the Bauhaus and in the Dada period specializing. So she was very engaged when I was a child in abstract art. And my dad was a stained glass window painter. So I rebelled and said, I don't want to draw what the teacher tells. I want to be more abstract. So I did what is unusual for a child to draw abstract. And then through my architectural education, learn to draw representative, what's really what the design should be like for the clients. Uh, so if you look at Picasso, for example, he started drawing in art school where realistic and then over the time of his life turned abstract. I did it the other way around. So these are some drawings from that time period inspired a lot by a very famous lady called Hannah Höch. She was the only female Dadaist living in Berlin. And the, she made these little mini drawings and I was inspired to draw those and I thought um, obviously as a child you sometimes want to be against your parents so I didn't do what they may be wanting wanted or what the teacher wanted. This uh, is the office of Mead Palmer. He won every prize. He's the same generation as Dan Kiley. He had his office in Virginia in Warrington in a little town and in the late 80s I went there as an intern. I was educated in Edinburgh at the university in landscape architecture. And as uh, uh, they, first of all, we had a sandwich where we had to work, but we also in the summers went to work in offices and the UK had a treaty with the United States for work visa. So I was selected and I could go there and it was the most profound experience because in his office, which had been run since 1947, I had to draw with pencil and color with pastel powder. Uh, the office was run by two ladies and I was their intern and I learned more there than ever uh, in any other office and it was also really inspiring because it was a multisensorial experience using the pen making the sharpening using the machine that we had a little rubber which was like a drill to clean the paper and scratching and changing so it was already something I was very noticing while working there. Moving on um, after my education uh, and during my education, I worked in Tokyo as an intern and then was invited back to work there as, a, as a, a professional designer, working my way up to the assistant manager and developing a landscape architecture department. But I'm showing you this sketch because it was a profound sketch which, which would lead me through my whole career 
uh, as a specialist for green roof design and particularly stormwater management, which again relates to my early childhood with exper experimenting with water and particularly now flood control. And I encourage you all to use drawing, particularly hand drawing. Now you can use the iPad if you want as a thinking tool, as an idea thinking tool. It is a tool to, to help you to understand. It's a language. While I was in Japan at the beginning, I couldn't speak Japanese. So I drew everything and I drew very fast to explain. This is the Hokkaido, Shinkansen Hokkaido train station in uh, Hokkaido up in the north in Sapporo. Uh, of the city of Sapporo um, and the main station. And it was a uh, secret project we developed with a hundred meter wide span without post construction. And on top of this roof structure, which are designed with a, an AA student who had recently come back to work in the firm, uh, we designed this park structure and it started my career uh, in being a green roof specialist. And then the, the skill is to understand, use the aerial as a conceptual overview, just on a side note, this is not a sketch lecture, but I think it's important while we are at it, what the sketches actually are used for. This is just to show an overview and the zoning, while this is the site immersion, and that already talks to the visual, which is one of the senses, and I argue we design too much for the visual sense which of course, 30 years, I also did to learn and I, there was no computers, no Rhino, nothing. So you had to draw by hand and be very skilled to do so. But while I was doing that, I realized this is not addressing four of the senses. How does this space smell? How does it feel? How you can't eat it, but you, you can touch it maybe. And, um, and there may be sound. So I think those things we were just doing sort of not really deeply. Another move forward, I, um, after a few years in Tokyo, I came back to Berlin, licensed as a landscape architect, designing a huge $2 million um, play area in the eastern part of Berlin, and then was um, hired to be the project manager of the biggest inner urban design project in Europe of the 90s, the Potsdamer Platz design by Renzo Piano. And this is an overview a few years ago from the air, showing you all the green roofs, the interior courtyards. And over about ten, uh, eight, nine years, I designed this and managed it on site with one intern every year training. All these interns now are all obviously landscape architects. And that had a profound, this project had a profound impact on stormwater management and is the key project worldwide used now because the water from the roofs did not only feed the green roofs, but it also uh, was used to recycle the water for toilet flushing and, and toilet flushing in an artificial lake adjacent to the site. Then I had my own office in Berlin and in Shanghai. And as you can see, the screens at that time, it's nearly 20 years ago now, are um, really uh, big and thick. Now the machines, everything is much smaller, you know that, slimmer. But you can see I still draw, in this case, even with ink pen, I still draw by hand. And um, while everybody in the office uh, didn't, I still did that, but I thought it was an important thing to do and communicate it. And then we started experimenting. Mm -hmm. Photoshop started and we started to experiment. So these are hand drawings for competitions I did where I, we used Photoshop filters. This is nearly 20 years ago where we used Photoshop filters um, that it looked like watercolors. And what I like about it, it has this sort of personal view, but it's still kind of a digital drawing. Then I was asked, I was invited to take part in the Beijing Sailing Club for the Olympics. And I was invited to go to China. And because I didn't speak Chinese, again, I used the language of drawing to explain to the professor I worked with who invited me, helping the competition, what the ideas I had and how we should be putting them on paper. So the language was still a really big issue in the sense we were still designing everything just using sight. We were not attentive to the other four senses enough. Then in my own office, I designed uh, in Shanghai, a lot of the uh, gardens with the Chinese staff. I, um, I did not prescribe anything. I just helped them to give an, some ideas how we do uh, designing in the West. And then we, uh, we obviously introduced the Asian designs as well. And this is uh, one of my sketches, a spatial study. I just thought I'd show you. But it wasn't in, in my time in, in, in Japan and particularly in China when I start, 
started what I loved the most about going to Asia was the multisensorial experience, the people cooking on the streets, the smells, the sounds, the smiles, the, the, the textures, the colors. So all those aspects had a huge impact. And I put in this, in, uh, this photo because that's something I found so wonderful about being there. They live, there's a lot happening on this, the streetscape and so on. So that then that experience then related to my undergrad teaching, I taught like 10 years ago, a lot of undergrad, the intro studio courses, and I taught sketching, as you can see here. But again, I was still teaching it traditionally perspective views, mostly eye level. I'm an eye level sketcher because that's the experience you experience uh, when you are in your spaces and very useful when you teach students how to design. And so again, still sight. I also did big projects for colleagues. This is for Patrick Condon. We did a lot of charrette design. And then in the end of the three days with all the specialists, the stakeholders, the mayor, uh, the students, the, the specialists for the different fields, it, uh, um, Patrick asked me, please draw it up and make a quick aerial. So these drawings, they are big drawings, but I had like three hours or so to draw this. Um, uh, and uh, this kind of Blade Runner city of North Vancouver, but this is now already uh, 12 years, uh, 12, 10 years ago, but it is still, you can see the, the boats have sailed. So we started to integrate sustainability, there's green roofs, there's solar cells. So it's starting to advance in itself. So another project, this was the Surrey, the, the Surrey Charette. Again, you can see, however, it is all to do with visualization at any level, at any scale. And I thought that's not enough. And then I did some other charrettes with people looking at, um, and this is on, in, uh, on Vancouver Island, looking at how they, they, there's some cities who have literally no water. So how the water reservoirs can also be activity spaces for bird watching so that people get a sensitivity to value water as one of the most important, not if not the most important resource as well. I wrote a cookbook while I was doing my first book, which Nadia mentioned on green roofs. You know, it's very technical. It's a uh, um, very scientific based. I needed some fun. So I wrote a cookbook on the side fusion food. I, I grew up in Germany, but a lot of my time I spent in Italy. I'm very connected, love Italy. And uh, so I tried to fusion that food with my Asian experience. And this is one of these uh, recipes I created with the dancing anchovies. But again, to represent it, it's visual. And then I experimented since the tablet came out and you will experience in a minute with the I iPad. And it was like in 2013, I used it to take notes while we were in studio and I sent my notes immediately to the students. They thought that was quite cool. They couldn't read my handwriting because it was with a stylus. It didn't work very well. So I said, well, Hopefully the stylus will be better. And as you know, now we have pens, it's all working fine. But in 2013, the writing was terrible. So it was really through the pandemic where this training on the tablet communicating all my drawings helped me and helped the students um, the, the teaching it. So I basically, instead of just teaching with slides, which I'm currently doing with you, I normally teach by drawing and the students draw with me. We'll do this in the second part a little bit. But what is important for you to see is um, to, that it is, a again, a multisensorial experience because you're putting pen to paper, the clicking. So all those experiences had an impact on me. And when I started writing my book, I was thinking we are doing something wrong in the education. Well, it's the wrong word. We are not doing it. We need to get more rigorous in doing it better. We are only going mostly with the students to site once at the beginning of the project, and that's it. However, that's just the project blank. While you're designing, you are in, 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 you know, investing time in learning about the project, maps, context, you're getting better. And then if you go back again and again, different times of day, sunshine, rain, snow, um, you experience it totally different. And this six stages show the way I interpret the design process. And if you look at the arrows carefully, it's not a linear process down. It goes back and forth between site immersion and recording and analysis, which is the, what the book is about, to help you to analyze your ideas, 
then synthesize them into ideas to make uh, final design proposals. And idea comes from edine, the Greek word edine, to see. So when you say to your professor, I have an idea, that basically means see professor or I just say, see what I've drawn, professor, that they know what you're doing. So this is the, the process of normally how you would do it. Well, then uh, we have the tablet and I started sitting in the landscape and use the tablet and then I started, and the smartphone, and then I started to realize, hey, I can animate with that thing. I can record. I can make photos, which are an investigation tool, not just a fact tool. It's not just a fact tool, the, the, the photography. You can investigate. I write a whole chapter, particularly citing um, um, Anne Winston Spurn, very famous landscape architecture professor from the United States, about her work on photography. So I started realizing, hey, that's a really cool recording tool. And then, because I like to draw more than write, I drew my book. And these are some of the ways I was starting to design the second book. And I was thinking about a toolbox. How can we design much more multisensory? And these are some of my private sketches. They are not the only person who saw those was Michelle. And Michelle saw these sketches and they said, draw more, draw more. And you can see in the top corner is always a number. So you know how many pages I drew, many, many, many. So I wouldn't lose track. And I do this also to see how I change my design process and how it evolves. And out of this process, I then developed a recording matrix, which includes the five senses and shows the recording tools for those and how you can visualize using those tools. And these are just some of the examples. Uh, and I use these icons also to develop this. But what the real issue here is, and this is what I was trying to say, is that this is actually not just a visual exercise. This is a cognitive exercise, and it is also philosophical. So in my book, I write quite a bit about philosophy. I did a lot of research in philosophy, and I, I then started to try to understand what actually happens when you look at a strawberry, for example and you run it through the icons um, of uh, uh, investigation. And what is really interesting is that um, obviously when you, when you eat it, there's all these experience which happen. So the observation, for example, happens, the touching, the taste, the smell, and so on. And, and even if it's maybe a bit rotten, when you squeeze it, it would be squishy. Um, so there's a lot of things happening with this, um, uh, why this cognitive process happens. So you have on one hand, the observation with the senses, you have your brain as the hard drive and on the other side, the synthesis, sadly there's my, my little head there. But basically what I'm saying here is it makes you remember of the past. So for example, if you, as a child, smell is one of the strongest senses of memorization. So if you had a, let's say, a strawberry cake with your granny and you went there as a child and that starts this emotion of being happy or the color red um, makes you excited because it's something you like the rather. It gives you a positive experience or somebody gave you a rotten strawberry and it makes you cringe uh, or you think about your mother's cooking. So there is this connection of the physical act and the cognition in your brain and the synthesis of this, what we call the perception, which is uh, sadly under my little mini screen there, but you can imagine it. So I just, so I said, I thought, well, if we can do this to um, a fruit, we could do this to the landscape. So I thought, well, if we can investigate this fruit, then why not sniff out the grass in the landscape? So I just drew this magical landscape near Kelowna imagination out of my head and I added the senses and what they could do. And what, when you sit there in the sunshine, for example, what the, and touch the grasses and 
and the, listen to the bumblebees and the sound of experience, what that cognitively does in your, in your head from an observation point of view and engaging with the landscape uh, and then getting that synthesis is was something I wanted to get a grasp on. So I thought that's all great, but how do you train students to do that? So I came up with sense walk mapping. I'm not the first one. Um, there is a uh, Professor Schaefer at SFU, Simon Fraser University in the late 60s started to do sound mapping. And um, a lady called Hildegard, she, um, she used that information to create then out of that a paper, which is very compelling and very important. And I cite it all in my book. But what is important that Schaefer had this idea to blindfold people and run them with, uh, with somebody on as pairs with somebody beside them, blindfold them, sit them down to relax that the other senses heighten and then run them through Queen Elizabeth Park, Park here in Vancouver to, uh, to describe the observations they, they felt and then document that in the late 60s, early 70s. And Hildegard Westerkamp, Hildegard was the first name of, of uh, I think she's German, at least the name sounds German. She then wrote a paper out of the, which is very important in the field of um, uh, the census uh, academic studies. And so I thought that's fantastic. So why not sound walks, sense walks? We look at all the senses and I used historic gardens from China, which I had visited which are like little rooms. I used very famous gardens as sense walk experience for the students to learn how to engage with the senses. And that is how that came about. And there's a whole chapter on that. And then I also describe modern gardens, which were designed for the senses, let's say for therapeutic purposes. I've published um, quite a bit on it. Two papers I will point out to you here, which you should look at. They're on my research gate, free to download. Uh, and I use it with my students, the multisensorial garden experience list. My students currently have to select their sites themselves, go out there, listen, smell it, touch it, feel it, and see it, not taste it. I told them not to eat the soil, so no tasting. Um, but all the other four senses and then start evaluating in the matrix I created or create their own matrix. This is just an inspiration to understand the site as is. And then from there start judging and designing is kind of judging. Well, I don't like it. I'm going to put five benches because there is no benches. So before you make a judgment or a design proposal, or a solution first understand the site rigorously before it is even investigated. And that has not been taught in school enough, only with um, the traditional things, wind, um, you know, traffic, all the tradition, noise, shade, heat, but not at a multisensory level. That's why I wrote these two papers and below is a, art, a book chapter I wrote for a book uh, which is also on ResearchGate, which uh, says we need to do sense walk mapping in the historic gardens, in this case in Germany, to keep them safe and get the public engaged how important these gardens are to keep them alive and support them financially and also by visiting them. So that multisensorial idea came up and that's a term I coined because you all are trained in visual literacy. That's been done since the 70s, 80s. They're wonderful sketchbooks, but multisensorial literacy, that is what this book is trying to achieve or what I'm trying to achieve in my teaching. And so um, that's just a, a point that I, additional to the visual literacy, which you are taught through drawing, autographic drawings like plan section elevation and axonometric and perspectival views at eye level and in the air. That's visual literacy, the multisensorial. But what is really interesting is the toolkit. 
So that is all pretty clear, but now it gets interesting. So I argue when you design, you need to also think carefully who you are designing for. For example, if you're visually impaired, the form of the chair, in this case, a chair, may be not as important as the sound it makes or the touch or the smell for a person who cannot see. So when we are designing, we should be thinking carefully about those aspects and not prioritize sight immediately and form and always beauty. If you can't see, the beauty is in the smell. The beauty is in the way the person glides his or her hand over the material of the chair, the edges and so on. So I started to divide design this toolbox of a priority list. And these are my inventions, my first initial drawings. You can see a drawing one. When I started thinking about my book, um, how to develop this, this then got more rigorous and you can see I'm doubting things and I'm scratching things out. I'm making mistakes. And intentionally, I think through my drawings and I can highly recommend you while you're at universities do exactly that because then the instructor can say, why did you strike this out? Why don't you like that drawing? And then you learn through that process. So I do these things myself. And then this is the final page in this case in the book. So you can see, I think it's important. First idea, second idea, multiple iterations. Look, number 13 page at the bottom. And then that's the final idea. It's a process which takes extensive time to do. And I think this one here is a good example to see and it shows your hierarchy. So maybe the hierarchy is different for the design of that chair. Maybe touch and smell and sound is more important and sight is the le least important priority. Of course, there are the practical reasons. Stacking of the chair, is it light, heavy, cheap, expensive, whatever it is. But from a point of the user, which is the main issue you need to address, a chair is only good if the user is comfortable on the chair. Otherwise, why would you design it? And so the same could go when you design a, a cup. So by making it possible that a multi, uh, visually impaired person can pour his coffee into a cup without somebody who is not visually impaired helping him or her. Well, how do you do that? How do you make that person able to do that? So I designed, I'm not the first one by the way, but I got inspired by using a cup and making one part of the cup's edge thinner. So while he pours or she pours the hot coffee in it, they can feel it rising so they are not going to spill it. So it just starts that process. And I thought, okay, that sounds all pretty good. We've looked at a cup. We have looked at a chair. And designers and landscape architects are the masters at the different scales. We design in comparison to an industrial designer and an architect at the most largest scale. We design at the country, the province, the region, the city, the block, the site, the garden. So I thought, why not a garden? So I made a garden for the blind and then run the same process. What is it when you cannot see? Of course, the path, the texture of the path is important. The plants in the garden to lure the person in with the smell is important and the sound before maybe the, the, the structure of the fence or the wall, uh, apart from maybe the texture the person can touch. And I did the same process again, as I did with the others. And then in the book, I describe it deeply with more refined drawings. And as you can see, I use drawing as a language. It's not perfect, it's not about that. And people spend much too much time on thinking perfect instead of thinking content in the drawing and what the drawing expresses for somebody who may not read drawing every day. For example, if you work with um, for the government or somebody who's not a designer and reads these drawings every day. 
So this is an important message for you. When to use what drawings, plan, section, elevation to communicate what and how to use it to investigate. And if I, I just go back, you see, I use the section to investigate. And then I use the area to show you guys what I'm looking at. And I use the plan to en enhance certain aspects. And then I make the priority list. And then you can see from that priority list, I start designing the space. So the smell is maybe very important. So it's the touch and the sound. And so the, what, what is important for who is using the gardens? And over the years, I've been teaching a seminar, which then uh, developed this book, which helped to develop this book. I acknowledged the students at the beginning and all the blogs of these seminars, the first ones we created the blogs ourselves. Now the students run it totally, they design it. But the first ones in 2018, 2020, and this spring, last year, spring 2022, and fall, it gets pop, more popular. I've taught it twice last, last year, and fall 22. Um, you can find all that online and can uh, look at 10 or 11, no, 11 assignments, uh, which are partially also explained in the book how students address different senses for different assignments. So if you have time, you can look at those. And these are some examples. So for example, I blindfold the students and give them mystery objects. So I have a box and I give them mystery objects and they draw them blind. And over the years, they said that was the most revealing experience for them to actually practice. You know, there's one thing, theory, me lecturing on it or presenting on it. And then there's you actually doing it. So tonight, when you go home, ask your partners to give you a mystery object. And then, but before you do this, you sit down with a scarf, blindfold yourself for four minutes so that the other senses, senses are more heightened and the brain has switched off the sense of sight. And then what it does is it heightens the other senses. So you can hear suddenly, you, suddenly your hearing gets stronger. Everything is changing and then draw. And you should do it twice. You should do it blindfolded. And you could, um, and then when you have done that, then you should also draw it with the eyes open and compare those drawings. And in this assign in these different assignments, the students also explored animation on the tablet, uh, understanding the stair not just from the engineering points of the ratios, the uh, the riser, uh, the, you know, the riser of the stair and the tread of the stair, but also from the movement in the stair and where the handlebars should be. And the big problem of the handlebars is always where they are fixed to the wall that like an elderly person, when they slide along, they hit their fingers and that's not a good thing. So you learn it by investigating or the, uh, this one is also a good one, um, paste. Uh, and then, and this is the biggest struggle. Drawing is easy, but analytical drawing and referential drawing is, I explain it uh, clearly, is what you see in front of you and you draw what you see or you draw things you cannot see. And in the, in the second part of this class today, I will teach you the cube method as an X-ray tool to investigate the landscape for analytical research and investigation. So you are thinking deeper when you design your project. And in this project, it was about taste of a lemon and then give it a higher hierarchy in measurement of taste of, um, for example, intensity of the sour experience to a timeline and so on. So uh, that drawing is used as a quantitative and qualitative research and analytical tool. This is, um, if it works, also an interesting one. This is um, Marissa explaining analytically the opening of an orange and what happens. And so it's important to understand you don't have to draw it round. It's not about that, but you have to draw it analytically and communicative and animated. And now we have that fantastic technology 
You can do this by hand on the iPad, or you can do it on your Rhino model, whatever you like, or a combination. But understanding drawing as a holistic language, international language, and a measuring and research tool, that is, I think, the strength. <clears throat> this is an old one uh, at the end, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> the exercise after the class on the last day, I say you have 10 minutes, summarize what you learn in the course. This is one example. There are lots of different ways of, um, and then the students draw yeah. it. Uh, and I think it is important that you look at those as well on the blogs. They are explaining, uh, you know, how the course, what the impression the course has had on the different kinds of students. Well, what's the future? That's a good question. This is a drawing I did a long, long time ago. I like to play with drawing and also with perspective of use and so on. I think the tablet will be a very strong tool. We are now learning AI. We are developing an AI platform research very soon next summer here as well. AI is coming in, <clears throat> generating graphic uh, um, images already, which is a challenge because a lot of the AI is drawing information from images which are maybe from artists online without copyright. So ethically, that needs to be um, discussed immediately. Same with text. You can write text now. But I still think um, that the uh, apart from that, the hand drawing and the design thinking has to be done by the designer. Maybe in 10 years, the uh, you outsource the representational drawings to a graphic designer. A lot of offices do that. So they know how much money they have to give for the images or the videos they make about the site. But that means that you could even spend more time on designing and thinking about the context as the, the architect or designer of a project. I also think that on-site teaching and understanding the site, this is last year in the undergrad course called Environment Urban Form in Infrastructure, a new course I'm teaching where I'm using hand drawing to investigate site first on campus in six, six assignments. And the last assignment is downtown where they have to investigate an area of the downtown with the landscape and look at certain issues, stormwater, whatever they want and then make proposals how that could be made more environmentally up to date or climate resilient. So this the use of um, on-site on teaching, I think will be key and we should be doing much more to actually experience the landscape. And the final drawing is you can't learn, you can't, you can't teach basics of the drawing but, but you can learn it, but you, you, it can't be really taught. You have to do it yourselves and you need to overcome the fear of fail and just do it. So it's not about drawing beautifully, at least not as a designer because we are, we are, not, we are artistic, but we are not artists. That's not only our expression tool, it's a refined tool. It's an analytical tool, it's an engineering tool. And I quote Laurie Olin here, drawing can't be taught, but it can be learned. So you can see me here practicing on our terrace on my iPad whenever I have a free minute to get better at it or train it like a tennis player. If you don't constantly play and practice, you're not um, going to get good at it. So it needs that time on your own to actually learn it. And I think this is something which a lot of um, uh, students find challenging. To be really good at this, you need to practice hours and hours. I've asked recently, I think a colleague of mine, Derek Lee from PWL, who draws very prolific and very well, we both sort of discussed, we would say maybe, um, well, maybe two, 3,000 hours overall um, to really learn it well is needed. And uh, that's an average we sort of came up with recently talking about it one day. Um, and I think you just have to spend that time. And when you are idle, have your little sketchbook with you and start drawing and use it as a language. That's it for the lecture part.